And we're joined this week by Willie Janeway, Executive Director of the Adirondack Council. Welcome, it's always good to see you. Tom, good to see you again. Every year the Adirondack Council puts out what it calls the State of the Park Report, what you see as the major issues in the park and kind of a scorecard, I guess, that rates how the state, the governor, lawmakers, and community leaders are doing uh, when it comes to overseeing the park, as well as some of your priorities and goals mm -hmm. for the year. And in this year's report, you talk about dealing with what you call the success of the park. And it's no secret that the Adirondacks are overcrowded. They're really, you've said this before, they're being loved to death, really. It's, it's wonderful that the Adirondacks are so well protected for 130 plus years, and it's wonderful that they're so popular. It is the best protected wilderness in the East. It's just an incredible resource, but it is so popular that so many people are coming to use it that the protections in place are being overwhelmed and it is at risk of being loved to death. You're absolutely right, Tom. And we see the pictures, especially on holiday weekends, Labor Day, Columbus Day, the overflowing parking lots, the cars parked along the roads, the cars in some cases parked along and we State Route 73. And we 220% of what the state identified as numbers to try and manage use at when we had 650 people on one Cascade Peak in one day. And also when I hear from a friend, oh, I'm not going hiking in the Adirondacks this Labor Day because I went there last year and it was so crowded. Those are all bad things. We have the capacity with this huge park to have even more people come and enjoy it but we need to manage it and educate people, help people plan their trips when they're home so they can reserve a site here, reserve a parking space there, so more people can come and enjoy the park because one of the reasons to protect it is to preserve it for posterity. Another is so people can enjoy it. And then there's the economic benefits and the jobs for the communities. If we don't manage it right, we lose on all three fronts. A number of other places will have people reserve. A parking spot, a camping site overnight, is that something that needs to be explored and adopted. Yes, the state of New York Department of Environmental Conservation has some programs like that in other places that need to be expanded and adjusted and tailored for the Adirondacks. New York State Park System, other parks that people go to have systems in place. Usually some space is set aside for first come, first serve, some for reservations. And obviously in the Adirondacks, one could have a system where for New York State residents who as taxpayers support the park, they might have a discount or a free pass versus charging more for folks who are not taxpayers in New York, not unlike with a fishing license. The state has added a few trails or is in the process of adding a few trails up to the peaks. Is that helping and is that enough or does the state really need to do more to tackle this? The state needs to do more, but first what's helping is that the state and the state leadership, including the governor, have recognized that there's a problem. And the first part of having a solution to overuse and loving the Adirondacks to death is to recognize that while it's a good problem to have, it is a problem. That then sets the stage to come up with a comprehensive plan and fund it and implement it to manage it. The state is starting to do some work on a couple of trails. At the current pace, honestly, we'd be talking 150 years before all the trails would get redesigned and rebuilt that need to be redesigned and rebuilt. There's not enough people, not enough dollars going into that effort, but it's one of the good ideas the state has had and it's one of the good things that is starting so you'll notice in the Adirondack Council's State of the Park, we give a thumbs up for recognizing the problem, a thumbs up for starting to take some actions, but a thumbs down for failing to have a comprehensive, well-funded plan, failing to identify ways of helping the forest rangers and getting more rangers or other staff and foresters out there to provide people with the information and help they need as visitors. And that's obviously a concern that you have. That is a huge concern. The average forest ranger in New York used to have maybe 25,000 acres that they were responsible for. Now they have over 50,000 acres. But it's much more than rangers. Not only do we need more forest rangers, we need more educators, more stewards, more trail crews, more planners um, to take a comprehensive approach so that the success of the Adirondack Park can be sustained for future generations. Right now, volunteers are doing a lot of that work. Volunteers, and there are some really dedicated, hardworking state employees doing all they can. But there's maybe 25% less than there were just oh, in the last administration. And forest rangers have more work because with such large crowds, there are more rescues. Yes, over 360 rescues for the forest rangers in the last year, so almost one a day across the state of New York, pulling them away from their much more important proactive educational work that would prevent accidents and prevent rescues if they could do them. It's, it's important and it's good that we're good at responding to rescues, but we should plan ahead and be proactive with more education, but that will require more people. 
When you talk about overuse, you're also concerned about the number of boats that you see coming up into the Adirondacks, also people bringing ATVs and riding them as well. Yes, Tom, people think, oh, overuse, Cascade, Route 73, and yes, those areas are crowded, but it's happening across the park. It's happening with other types of use, like with ATVs, it's happening with boats. So one of the things that we have been pushing for is stronger protection to make sure that boats coming into the park are clean, drained, and dry, that we have boat wash in the state, and private partners are now funding a system throughout the Adirondacks of boat wash stations and people, but it's essentially a voluntary system. The requirement is you have to make a good faith effort. It's not mandatory. So there's a beautiful new boat wash station on the Adirondack Northway as you come up through Glens Falls. That deserves and gets a thumbs up, but compliance is voluntary, and that hasn't been strengthened. That gets a thumbs down because we need to go to mandatory or stronger protections. And you're saying the overwhelming majority of boats are going right by that? That Washington particular Station. spot, we're being very generous if we say 10% of the boats have stopped to be inspected, probably even less than that. And you'd like to see it mandatory throughout the We Adirondacks. have a system around the park of stations with people, so we've paid for that now. It's crazy that people should be allowed to drive by those. When there's a truck inspection station that's open, the trucks have to stop and get inspected, make sure they're compliant with safety rules. We could have the same system in place here in the Adirondacks. We had the infrastructure paid for, we just don't have the rule. And obviously the concern is they could be bringing invasive species yes. with them attached to those boats. And the negative environmental and economic impact of getting more invasives in these waters of the Adirondacks would just be devastating. A couple of invasive species are knocking at the door right now. The hemlock oleodelgid, the emerald ash borer. You were here at a forum that we held in June yes. talking about the impact climate change is having on the Adirondacks and how it could speed up uh, the arrival of invasive species that could help more of them survive during the winter months. I would say that could, it is happening. It is happening. Overall climate change, how do you evaluate how the state is dealing with climate change and the impact it's having on the Adirondacks? The climate change law passed by the governor and the legislature, is that a major first step? The Governor Legislative Climate Leadership Community Protection Act that was passed is huge. Um, if we had different size thumbs up, that would get the biggest thumbs up. Just by itself, that is an historic huge accomplishment. We can't cheer that enough. In some ways, the real work will now begin on putting together the committees and implementing it, but it's a huge success that New York has stepped into a void and taken a national role on that. With where the Trump administration is going, bringing back coal, Cuomo, the legislative leaders deserve a lot of praise for taking that action. We'd like to see that complemented with action on the local level dealing with the invasive species that are also coming at a more accelerated, coming at us at a more accelerated rate because of climate change. And you talk about the rollbacks. So when it comes to air pollution, yes. is the concern that we may take steps back from the gains we've made over the past few decades if federal regulations are rolled back? The Trump administration has taken steps back. We as the Adirondack Council have challenged those in court. We have one in court, but we still have to do more. There are 36 coal-fired power plants in the Ohio Valley with installed pollution control equipment. It used to be required to run during the summer by both Republican and Democrat administrations. The last two years, it has not been running because the Trump administration hasn't required that. We're in court fighting over that. And so we are seeing some data points showing increases in some of the pollutants that we all worked so hard to remove. We removed so many of those pollutants. We have loons back. We have trout back. We have cleaner water again. But we could easily lose ground, and we've seen two years not just of a flattening, but we've seen things move backwards with pulling out of the Paris Accord, removing the clean power plan, the mercury rule. It has been a, a full frontal assault on historic bipartisan environmental protections and that really negatively impacts the community's wilderness economy of the Adirondack North Country. You talk about court battles. There's been a major court ruling this summer having to do yes. with the clearing of uh, forest land, forest preserve land for snowmobile trail the 27 mile a snowmobile trail. That has been put on hold right now and the question seems to be over what qualifies as timber. Have you weighed in on this and do you agree that, that far too many trees are being cut down to make way for these trails and that there needs to be a clear definition of what timber and trees are in, in the uh, Adirondack Park? The Adirondack Council gives the court a thumbs up for this four to one decision saying that the amount of cutting that was involved was too much. Yes, you're right. Part of the decision was saying that even the smaller trees are still trees and should be protected. But the key thing is that the court was saying there was a cutting that, at a level that was substantial, and that's unconstitutional. 
previous court decisions have said very de minimis, insignificant quantities of tree cutting for safety, for a trail, those are allowed. So the court said, yes, we can have some limited amount of snowmobile trails in the Forever Wild Forest Preserve. Yes, we can have some cutting. We can't have that much. We give that decision the thumbs up because we think it is a very balanced, appropriate decision consistent with the protection. Those snowmobile trails could be built with a lot less cutting, and that's what should happen.